All right. So look, uh, last week I kind of started a message about G and I titled it Jesus, your Jubilee. And we kind of, we didn't really didn't get to the main point. And uh, the, the youth is uh, dismissed. I know Sister Nye is about ready to move that way. But uh, so we, we tied, I titled it Jesus, your Jubilee, meaning that Jesus is the Jubilee. Amen. And we kind of went through the, the, the passages of Scripture, some of the passages that speak about uh, the Jubilee in the Old Testament. But we never really got to the main point that I wanted to get to. So I kind of wanted to uh, at least finish that idea up. But before we did, I wanted to review to you um, in Hebrews uh, chapter four, it was a, a couple of just spots here in Hebrews chapter four. And we don't have to necessarily turn to all of these, but it was talking about how the children of Israel, God, God said, and this is a New Testament book, but he's talking about in the Old Testament. And he talked about the fact that they weren't able to enter into the rest of God. And he was specifically talking about his servant Joshua bringing them in. And the idea here was really all about rest. And that God, there's multiple types of rest in the Bible, but the Sabbath was the first type of rest, right? Which a, was a once a week rest, amen? On the, on the, what we call Saturday was the Sabbath and that there was a recognition of that and that they were not to do any servile work on, a sab on the Sabbath and that it was supposed to be to give all the glory to God. And it went, you know, and, and he even had, it groomed them for that with the manna that fell from heaven. You remember we talked about that, that they had to gather up double the amount on, on the sixth day and that it would last them for the seventh. And they tried to get more, it would turn to worms, but that they had to trust him that if they would, that if they would do it, that he would take care of them. Amen. And so, and so we talked about some of that and, but, but it says that specifically regarding that rest that Joshua was to bring them into and, 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 and the point to the author of Hebrews is this. Listen, if Joshua had brought them into the fulfillment of rest, then the psalmist would not have talked about it later that there was another rest to come. And the, and the types of the Sabbath and the types of God's rest, because it says that God created for six days and then he rested and he rested because his work was complete. And last week I spoke of the fact that Jesus' work was complete, so he sat down at the right hand of the Father, amen? And so his work is a finished work. And that we as believers are the, the, the ever ongoing journey of Christianity is to learn the truth that we really can rest in the work that Christ has done. Because what we tend to do is we tend to try to take matters into our own hands. We tend to try through, through whether it's through religious service, how much we go to church, how much we read the Bible, how much we pray. All those things are extremely important, but none of those things make you righteous. The finished work of Jesus is what makes you righteous. And when you learn how to rest in that, now all of a sudden he'll start to minister to you and he'll give you strength and he'll give you a desire to do those things. Amen. Sometimes it's financial situations and circumstances. We try to take matters into our own hands. And when we do, oftentimes we get ourselves in trouble. Sometimes it's relationship situations. We'll try to take matters into our own hands. And when we do, we can get ourselves in trouble. But we need to learn how to rest. Okay. So what he said, though, was that they're not going to enter into my rest. And, and the reason that they weren't going to enter into his rest was for a couple of things. Number one, it says that the word that they heard did not profit them because it was not united with faith. Now, I got to tell you that this whole book right here is full. This is nothing but the word of God right here. And you can believe every word upon this page. Amen. You can believe it with all of your heart and you must believe it with all of your heart. And you need to unite your faith to the living word of God. And if you will allow your faith to be united with the, the, the word of God, amen. We, we talked about that. You know, we had a speaker talk about that recently about the rainbow word of God, that the rainbow word of God is the living word of God and that God wants to speak to your heart. And, and if you and I will learn how to let the word of God be united with faith, it will begin to transform our lives. It will begin to transform our mindsets and it will begin to transform our journey of living with him. But, but the author said that 
the word didn't profit them because it was not united with faith. And then he goes on to say that uh, that they that, that that the word preached to them, they failed to enter in because of disobedience. So that's you know we need to probably pause just for a second and we need to come to the realization that disobedience towards God and His word is a big deal. Yes, Amen. I mean, God expects that his people called by his name are going to believe him at his word. That's what that's what part of being a believer is. All right. Now, now, I, now, listen, I don't want to negate. And I'm not here to make anybody feel squir squirmy, but, you know, but as we move forward, let, let us understand that there is a there is an ongoing journey of learning to believe God. But nevertheless, let us just cut through the chase and let us understand God ex doesn't expect God demands that those that are his would believe his word and unite their faith to his word and to by his grace, by his power. By his Holy Spirit, we're in the new covenant now, obey the truth of his word. And then he said this, he said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, whenever we go back and we think about this particular story, I just wanted to, because because I felt like it kind of shifted gears on me a little bit whenever I was reading it, reading it again, you know, to, to prepare for tonight and a big emphasis on God's word came to the forefront of my heart. And God's promise to them was that he was bringing them to a place of rest, a place where he would give them victory over their enemies, a place where his people would live for him and bring glory to his name. Amen. One of the things that I want you to understand, too, and it's becoming very paramount and real and, and very alive in my heart and mind, is that this whole thing that we're experiencing in our in this temporal life is all about giving him glory. The, the fact that he created this physical realm and he created physical man and Adam to co-rule or co-regent with him and to reproduce in his image and his likeness was that mankind in Adam and his offspring was going to give God glory, a reflection of his glory, a reflection of his image. And God has not changed his mind about that. And so in reality, everything that he does in our life and even him ultimately sending Jesus for us, it's really all about his glory. It's not about our glory and it's not about us receiving acceptance. It's about him getting what's due for him. Amen. Um, and so that was God's plan. And, and after, even after they entered the land of Canaan, which is the promised land, they, they still did not really, they did not do what God wanted them to do. They did not give him glory. They were supposed to be a light in the midst of the world around them. They were supposed to be a light in the midst of the world around them. Let, let me just say this. This has kind of been on my heart a little bit. Like in the Old Testament, there was a, a while back, there was a song that we sang and this was probably two years ago now. And it, 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 in the song, it said, there are no other gods above you or before you. And somebody said, you, and I, I can't, I think I know who it was, but I'm not positive. And they were like, before when I sang that song, I was like, duh. But we had been studying and we came to the realization that in the Old Testament, that those gods, Baal and Molech and Chemosh, they weren't just statues. But that they actually represented demon spirits. And that demon spirits and fallen angels throughout the ages have been receiving worship from humanity. And that they've been actually stealing God's glory away from him. Because instead of him receiving his worship, okay, the, they, the humanity now is worshiping them. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a leap here, and it is my contention that the men of old, the men of renown in the Old Testament and, and during the pre-flood, those, ne those Nephilim, as we call them, y'all know what I'm talking about? If not, just go read and come ask me later. Those Nephilim that the Bible says they were men of renown, 
History would tell us they were the kings of the earth. They were giants in the land. It is my contention, Goliath would have been one of them. Og of Bashan would have been one, one of them. The, this is where Zeus, theoretically, this is not just a mythos. This, these things would have been, I believe these things were real. Zeus and Mer demigods and all of these things and statues were made to them and hum humanity worshipped them. And, and what I'm trying to tell you is that when they were killed and their spirits were released, now the word of God says that we are engaging in a battle against spiritual entities. And they are still trying to vie and to take away from God the worship that is due his name. How do they do that? Through acts of lust. They entice. They entice. I'm not going to sit here and list it all off. But I've preached it before where, where these, whenever a person is bound by a spirit in that sense, you might even go for a period of time and then the next thing you know, it's like, it's my turn. I want my time. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that everything that God has done is to receive glory. Amen. And your purpose in this life is to give him glory for he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be exalted. He is worthy to be magnified. His word says that it's true. And when we go contrary to that, we're now walking in the midst of disobedience. God wanted to bring them out of their slavery into the promised land where they could be a light in the midst of darkness, where they could give him glory, but they failed him. They, could, they didn't have the faith. Only Joshua and Caleb had the faith to believe that God could give them the victory over those giants. Y'all remember that story? And so what it says was, is that the majority of the, the majority really didn't make it in. All those men that were alive during that time frame that could not believe God, could not unite their faith to the word of God, they, their bones bleached the Sinai Desert is what happened. They never finished the cro a cross. They never made it into the promised land. I'm going to tell you tonight, my friend, I don't know what your position is on salvation, once saved, always saved, can lose it. Can, I, I don't know about all that, but I know one thing. One day we're all going to stand before the Lord. And we're going to give an account. And, and, and I'm telling you, it's becoming more and more clear to me that this eternal soul of ours is very, very important. And we need to start t treating it as so. And we need to start reverencing the word of God and not treating the word of God as though it's something common and not treating the blood of Jesus as though it's something common and not treating the spirit of God as though it were a common thing. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But, but it, listen, it wasn't just that they didn't have faith to take on the giants. There were some other things that were going on. Number one, I was thinking about this. They really didn't like the way God was doing things. <laughs> Somebody help me out here. They, didn't really, they got tired of the manna. That's right. yeah, and the manna is a direct relation to the, in a sense, it's the written word of God. Because the manna was Jesus and Jesus is the word. They, they got tired of the manna. They, they, they didn't really, I'm not going to get into that. I could get into the whole flock of quail and all of this stuff, you know, that because they, they wanted flesh. Boy, you can preach on that. But, but they got tired of the manna. They got tired of God's provision. How many times has, listen, each and every person in this room, if you've been serving the Lord for any length of time, we have all at some point in time gotten tired of of the way God was doing something. We got we wanted him to do something differently. We believe, you know, no, I want him, I, I feel like he should do it this way. And, and we start to get frustrated because he's not really doing it the way that we wanted him to. But number two, they still had a love for the place that they had come from. See, they, they longed sometimes to go back. See, until, until, our, until our sin becomes offensive to us. Sometimes there's just this still a, this slight little there's the, there's this thing that that calls us home that's trying to call us home. You, you remember they did now listen, I don't want you to they didn't like the shackles, I don't believe. They didn't like the shackles and the chains, right? The slavery part of it. They didn't like having to go gather their own straw and make their own bricks. But they really like those melons. And the garlic and the onions and the leeks. And if they can just have that, 
They were probably ready to, willing to endure the, the chains for just a little bit longer. So they didn't really like the way God was doing things. And, and they really still had a little bit of a love for where they had come from. But that was not God's plan for his people. And it's not God's plan for his people now. God does not want his people uh, having a love for the past. Having a love to, and, and a willingness to go back. And God wants you and I to love his word. To respect his word. And, and men have died for this word. And for us to... Re- Unite our faith to his word and for us not to be disobedient towards his word and for us to hold to it and believe it and to trust it and not just our favorite scriptures, but but the entirety of God's word and even the parts of it that we don't like because it's nourishment for our soul. It's going to bring light to our spirit. His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It's like it's manna from heaven. And, and Jesus said that, if you, if that my flesh is true meat, my blood is true drink. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you might have been dead before, but now in Christ you're alive. And in order for that to grow, you're going to have to have the word of God. See, one of the things that I want you to know, and I'm pretty sure some of this will come out of my message Sunday, but he saved them from what they were in, and his plan for them was so much better than what they were wanting to go back to. You you, you see what I'm saying? And, And I want you to know this, too, that he's always working on something bigger than we can see. Many times we can, we, we just see like right here in front of us, we see our trial, we see our tribulation, our situation, and we're like, man, but we're not seeing the bigger picture of God. Then God's got a big old plan, amen? And, and he's asked, listen, that's why I said earlier, it is a privilege. It may not seem like a privilege to clean the toilets. It may not seem like a privilege. And listen, I'm not trying to, to, to some preachers, you know, trying to like stir everybody up so they can get people to work. That's, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to make a point. I have come to the realization, and I have admitted this before, and I don't know why I feel like I have to say it again. But I have admitted before that there's been times that I've been in ministry that I was almost like looking for a way out. Because it wasn't what I expected or it wasn't what I wanted. And lately, it's not like that. Lately, it's like, I ha- I not, let me tell you something. I have repented. My heart has been broken over that. My heart has been broken because I have realized with a heart full of gratitude what he has done for me. See, he rescued me. But, but let me tell you something. He rescued me not just because he loved me and he wanted to rescue me. He rescued me so that I would give him glory. And, when, and now it's like, Lord, what a privilege. What a privilege that you called me to work for you. I'm telling you right now, I've got almost every single time I come here to pray and to get into the presence of the Lord, I'm, remind, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed again with the truth that what a privilege to work for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, I mean... I, I'm not trying to go on and on down this vein. I really don't want to, but you know, I'd be like, I mean, why can't the place be packed out? You see, these kinds of things affect people. But the reality of it is, I was just sitting here worshiping earlier and I was thinking like this, Lord, if it's just me and Naya left, I pray that I would have the grace in my heart to, to, to where I would give you the glory that is due your name. Amen? Because it's a privilege to serve you. Listen, you're going to, if you hold on to the Lord, you're going to gain eternal life. (laughs) No, this is not some Aesop's fairy tale. Aesop's fable. This is the living word of God. God has a plan for you to become a son and daughter of God and to be part of an eternal family. It's a privilege to serve the king. You've been called by God. No man can come to the Father except he first be drawn. No man can come to Jesus. He 
said, let the Father first draw, and then God draws by his Holy Spirit. So if you're in this place tonight, and you have something going on in your heart that says, I want to know him more. I'm not where I need to be, but I sure am glad that I'm not where I used to be. Then you can rest assured, my friend, hallelujah, that the Holy Spirit knocked on the door of your heart, and he did something to you to draw you toward him. Towards him. Praise God. That's a privilege. The God of the universe. Huh. He scattered the stars in the sky, breathed life into a lump of clay, and he spoke to you. Hallelujah. One way or the other. Come on. Glory to God. Praise you, Jesus. And so look, what I wanted to say is, is that he's up to something bigger, my friend. He's up to, and you know what he's up to? He's given birth to this man child named Jesus. And whenever he called Abraham out, he said, come out of your father's house. And he created a nation out of him. And through that nation, he ultimately gave the world Jesus. And while they were wandering in the wilderness, he gave them the instructions for the tabernacle. And one day I need to preach a message just on this. A nine o'clock and a three o'clock sacrifice every day. Whole burnt offerings. Cut them open and looking for tumors. Uh oh, he got a tumor on his kidney. Throw that one away. Cut open another one. Inspect it. Okay, this was good. That'll be good for the nine o'clock. Now we gotta find another one for the three o'clock. A perpetual fire on the altar all day long and sacrifices at 9 a.m., 3 p.m. And the and the Sabbath changing out the bread with the frankincense and pouring the frankincense. So every week a reminder. Every year a day of atonement reminder. Every day, twice a day a reminder. And when the fat would burn, it would rise into the sky. And it would be a sweet smelly savor in the nostrils of God. And all of that, why did it smell fat? Doesn't smell good when it's burning. Why did it smell good to God? Because it's a constant, perpetual reminder. One day I'm going to send my son. And this is my message for Sunday. But he says, a body you have prepared for me, O oh Lord. I've come to do that will, O oh God. When the day came and he sent it, Jesus, the darling of heaven, the manifestation of the plan of the Father, a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. <coughs> oh, hallelujah. He's always up to something bigger. And he's still giving birth to Jesus. <laughs> he's still giving birth to Jesus because Jesus is still being born in the hearts of men each and every day and you and I can be a part of that. Right. Hallelujah. He, you and I, he wants you and I to be a part of that. He wants you and I to give him glory however he speaks that to us. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, was, I did put a little note here. That's why I brought these papers because I didn't put it in my iPad. Whenever I was talking about the manna in the, in the Bible, connecting the two, and I said how they didn't like the manna, I wrote on my notes, I said, I venture that many Christians, if they got into the Bible, would not like the way God is doing things today. They would not. Y'all you, you understand what I'm saying? There, there's a process of time that it takes for us to get from point A to point B, if point B is a place where we begin to really, really, really love the word of the Lord, I'm telling you right now, there's a long process that gets you from to where you're not even in the word and to where you get in the word and you're like, I don't really like the way he's saying. And see, that's the problem that we have in the church today. No, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not here to pick on nobody. I'm not going to start calling nobody's names out, but I'm trying to make a point that a lot of times the word of God is not presented in the way that it's written because of the fact that it's offensive God's word is offensive to humanity because humanity has his own will and his own desires to go his own way. And, and, and whenever you read the word of God, the way that it's, the way that it's written, then, then many times it, it, it has an effect. No, it, it always has an effect on us. Look, at the end of that passage in Hebrews 4 is, is the famous Verse Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. You can put that up for me. It says. For the word of God is living. And active. And sharper than any two edged sword. And it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. Of joints and marrow. And look at this. And it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. 
And so what I want you to see there is that is that the spirit you have you are a spirit. That's the part of you that has eternal life and that's the part of you that has God consciousness or the ability to have God consciousness. And until you became a born again believer, when the spirit of God came on the inside of you and your spirit became one with his spirit, now your spirit came alive to God. But you have but you have a soul, you are a soulish being. And your soul is made up of your mind, your will, your emotions, your mind, what you think, your will, what you want, and your emotions, how you feel. And, and everything about our humanity, if it's left to itself, is going to go contrary to the will of God. Because what God's will is for our life many times is the opposite of what our will is for our life until we start to learn how to die to self so that we will begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Lord, Lord, let self die. Amen. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. And let me tell you something. The word of God will, will help you discern your own intents of your own heart. Motives of the heart are a big deal. We can sit here and do all kind of works and on the outside looking like we're doing it for the Lord. But in reality, if we had a sit, get alone with the Lord session and the Holy Spirit started dealing with our heart, we might find out that much of what we had done was to be seen by men. And that, the, and that, that, that we really didn't practice, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Because we wanted some glory for ourselves. God is not going to share his glory with us. And listen, if we're honest with one another, there's probably a good chance that we've all kind of been guilty of that a little bit at some point in time in our life. And I don't know about you, but look, the Lord said he's not going to share his glory. So he wants to do that work on the inside of us. And that's the ongoing saga, right? Man's will versus God's will. What I want versus what he wants. My natural mind versus versus his word. My natural mind, what I perceive, my opinions, what I want to believe. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I got my own opinions and I know what I believe. You know, there's a couple of problems that we have. Number one, before we're saved, you can't even understand the things of God. No, really, you need to understand that. That's why many of you, before you were even saved, people start talking about things of the, of the, of the Word of God and you'd be like, that's dumb. Or that doesn't make any sense. Tune me out. Turn the pay, Turn the channel. Okay. But if you look at, you don't have to turn to it. But in, in the letters, one of the letters to the Corinthians, it says, "But we have not received the spirit of the world." It's actually First Corinthians chapter two, verses twelve through fourteen. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. And then he goes on to say this in verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the spirit. They are foolishness to him. And neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So before you give your heart to Christ and before the Holy Spirit comes in and brings your spirit alive to the things of God, you can't even understand the things of God because you're dead in your spirit. And these things are only discerned through the spirit. But then once you're alive and you start to get into the word of God, what may start to happen in the beginning or sometimes whenever you're listening to someone preach the gospel and you're not in to the word of God and things that are said start to offend us. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And something rises up on the inside of us and we don't like what it's saying. Well, there's a good chance that it's because that, that our flesh doesn't want to die in that area. But the word of God is very clear, amen, that, that the word of the Lord is desired to lead us and guide us in the right direction. All right, so just real quick, in one of the passages that we talked about, it says you're to count all seven Sabbaths of years. So we're talking about Sabbath, Sabbath rest. So not only was there a weekly Sabbath, but there was also a, a, a Sabbath of years. Y'all remember that? Every seven years was considered a Sabbath of years. And then you were supposed to count seven Sabbaths. And that equaled 49 years. And that was the Jubilee. That was the year of Jubilee. Right? And what they were told is, 
not only on the Sabbath day, the weekly, were they not supposed to do any extra work, and they were supposed to do the extra work on the, on the sixth day and, and trust God on the seventh day and rest, but on the seventh year, they were not allowed to sow seed into their fields. So that means that the sixth year had to hold them over for the seventh and the eighth year because they would sow the field in the eighth year and they wouldn't reap their harvest again until the ninth year. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that that requires faith. That requires faith that God is able to take care of you. And I ended up bringing in the tithe. The concept of the tithe in that, and I, and I want to just say that again. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not here to beat it, beat it down, but I want to make this point. It requires faith to pay your tithes. It, re but but not only that. Listen, I want to tell you something. The children of Israel went into Babylonian captivity for seventy years because they did not do what God told them with His land. It says it in, the, in, the, in one of the, the Chronicles. It says, be, he says, my land will lay fallow. That means I'm plowed for those 70 years because that's how many Sabbaths that you did not let my land lay fallow. And so one of the things that I've realized because I'm ultimately going to get you to the Jubilee and the Jubilee is all about freedom for the believer. The Jubilee is all about freedom for the believer, but it's freedom that results in you desiring to lay your life down for him because he laid his life down for you. And what I wanted you to understand is this, is that when you truly belong to the Lord, listen, it, I, I'm just going to give you a crash course. If you have truly gotten saved, if you really did ask Jesus to live, to come into your heart and you have felt a difference in you from that time. And that means the Holy Spirit lives in you. That means now you belong to him. And he ain't letting go of you easy, my friend. <laughs> you Listen, you can try. You can try to run. You can try to hide. You can try to rebel. You can try to do all kinds of stuff. But if you make business when you talk to him, see, no, because you know why? He wants to get you to a place where he can receive glory out of you. He didn't save you just so he could get you off whatever you was on or he could get you out of the mess you were in or fix your finances or fix your marriage. He does all that stuff. That stuff's easy for him to do. He just pluck you right out of where you were and set you free. But he's doing it for a bigger purpose. He wants glory out of you. He wants to use your vessel. That's, that's definitely my message on Sunday. The a body he has prepared. Hallelujah. And he wants to use us. To give him glory. Yes. One way or the other. Some people are going to hit some drums with some drumsticks. Some people might be drinking coffee with a family member that don't know Jesus. And have an opportunity to tell him. Oh no, I live, I live for the Lord now. See. Praise God. And that's it. So, so you count off these seven Sabbaths of years and on the 49th year, on the day of atonement, which is the 10th day of the month history, you blow a horn to signal the 50th, the 49th year, which is the year now of Jubilee going into the 50th year. It's amazing to me that this day happened actually on the day of atonement. Which is the one day a year that the high priest would go beyond the veil with blood and put it on the mercy seat. Which, which allowed God's presence to be with his people for another year. And there's so much types and shadows connected to Jesus in this that I, would, I don't even have time to begin to peel the first layer off. But on the Jubilee was the day of atonement when blood was placed upon the mercy seat. Listen, if you went back to Exodus 25 verse 8, you don't have to turn there. But the Lord said, build me a tabernacle so that my presence can dwell with my people. And the reason that his presence could dwell with his people was because once a year, the high priest first taking a sacrifice of an innocent animal for himself within the veil. And then secondly, coming back out and bringing blood for the people that it allowed a covering to take place that allowed God's presence to be with his people for another year. I'm here to tell you that the reason that you can have a relationship with God, the reason you can have 
have intimacy with the Father is because of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And I'm here to tell you that there's a jubilee. Hallelujah. I wanted you to know about that. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 21. Verses 1 through 5. Can you go to the NASB version? Can you do that for me? This is talking about the Jubilee. The year. Now, we've already talked about the land. We've talked about what God demanded from his people. But now I want to talk to you about people that were slaves. People that got themselves in financial mess. Most of the time, whenever I've been in a financial mess, it was because of poor decisions I made. I don't know about you. I'm not saying that it can never be another story. I'm just telling you what's happened to me. And, and, and they had a provision for that even in the Old Testament. And the provision for that was that a fellow Hebrew could indenture himself as a slave to another Hebrew. But that the story was, was that in the seventh year, so that there were, every seventh year they would be able to be set free and then the Jubilee was was a, was a big freedom parade, amen? And so here it says, now these are the ordinances which you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. If he comes alone, he shall go out alone. If he is the husband of a wife, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God. Then he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. And look at this. And he shall serve him permanently. He's going to mark him. He's going to put him on the, put him up to the doorpost. He's going to drive it all through it. And now he's got a, he's got an earring in his ear, and it's a constant reminder that he was a willing servant towards his master. He had been set free. He he, he did not have to serve his master. He could he could he could leave. But in this case. He, he, his master was so good to him that he didn't want to leave him. And, and what I want to tell you is this, is that God has been so good in this sense that he has created you and I with a free will. He has created you and I with a free will and he gives you the choice. He gives me the choice of whether or not we're going to serve him. All of us, in some way, shape, or form, before Christ, found ourselves to be slaves. This man had actually produced a family while he was living as a slave. The Word of God says that with Jesus, anybody that believes in the name of Jesus, God gives him power to become a son of God. He gives you power to become part of the family of God. And so, so it's a type of if you've been purchased and now you've become part of the family of God. Now, the, even though in the seventh year you're able to go free, the servant's like, where would I go? Why would I leave? He's too good for me to leave. See, when the Lord delivers you with his blood. When the Lord pulls you out and delivers you out from the slavery that you were in. Listen, it might take you a little while to recognize that the Lord delivered you. Okay? You might still be punch drunk a little bit. All right? I'm just saying that happens to people because it sure took me a while. All right? But what I'm trying to say is this. Once you gain revelation of what the Lord did and how he pulled you out, the, the, the right response is... <laughs> Lord, where would I go? Who else has the words of life like Peter said? There's nowhere else for me to go. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I want to serve you, Lord. Amen. You know, one of the things that kind of stuck out to me uh, as I was working on this earlier today 
is that I wanted to say, see, it kind of goes back to the Sabbath. You had to, God demanded that they obey. The, the, the Sabbath of years, right? Don't sow your seed, right? And, and look, look, and then even when I was saying that about the tithe, he, he said, okay, but look, this is the thing. Not only does it take faith, but guess what? You don't even belong to yourself. If you're a true child of God, some people don't like that kind of preaching. I'm telling you right now that it'll rattle some cages. No, I'm here to tell you that you do not even belong to yourself if you're a child of God. The Bible says you've been bought with a price, the precious blood of a lamb. You were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. You have no right. The, the, the word of God says in Malachi that you've robbed me, the Lord says. I'm not even preaching on time, and I'm trying to make a point. Will we submit to God in his ways? Will we submit to God in his word? He said, you've robbed me. How have we robbed you, Lord, in your tithes and your offerings? What he's saying there is, it doesn't belong to you. The breath in your lungs doesn't belong to you. The money, he lets you keep 90% of your money. You, you, whatever you give over here ain't going straight in my pocket, my friend. It's going for the work of the Lord. And even if you don't want to give money at this place, you need to find a place where you can pour. If you are a true disciple and child of God, you need to find a place that you believe is preaching the gospel and you need to pour. But listen, if you come to church here, come on. Don't, don't get me to go on that far with it. But look, let's just keep moving. You were bought with a price. You know, you know uh, the price of Gomer. Y'all know who Gomer is, Hosea's wife. Not that, yeah, we preached on that recently. Some of y'all might not have been here. The Lord told the prophet Hosea, "Go, go marry a woman of whoredoms." What? Yeah, go marry a woman of whoredom that'll commit whor whor whoredom against you. Why in the world would God request such a thing from a prophet? You know, what the, you know what I know that the Lord showed me? Because I, I prayed. I'm like, Lord, what, what, what are you doing? i tell you what I'm doing. I need a prophet that understands my heart. I need a prophet that understands my heart and understands how I feel when my own people called by my name commit adultery on me, cheat on me, and keep going back, and keep going back, and my heart is broken. And I keep taking them back, but they keep going back. I need a prophet that understands my heart and his heart is broken so that he'll speak forth my word for the way that I wrote it. You know, you know how much it costs? And, and so in chapter 3, she does exactly what the Lord says she was going to do. She goes and she cheats on it. And whatever her little escapade was, it resulted in her ending up on the slave market of sin. She, she ended up back in the slave market. And so, so so the Lord told her, go back and buy her. And so he had to go to the slave market. Do y'all remember what her purchase price was? You probably know. Fifth, this, is, this is amazing. 15 shekels of silver plus a homer and a half of barley. If you calculate it out, some, some commentators say this, that a homer and a half of barley equals 15 shekels of silver. So when you put the value together, it's 30 shekels of silver, which was the cost of a slave according to the book of Exodus. If, a, if your ox gored a female slave or a male slave, you had to pay the owner 30 shekels. So it's the price of a slave. How much did Judas sell out Jesus for? 30 shekels. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus purchased you with his blood. He redeemed you off the slave market of sin with his blood. You had a jubilee. Hallelujah. The Lord has released you from your bondage. And now what he's asking you to do is the same thing that he did for you. And what that is, is that he was willing, according to the Father's will, to become a man so that he could suffer the death of the cross, so that he could go through the torture and the torment, so that he could reconcile you into the will of the Father, so that he, he could give you the opportunity to be in intimate relationship with him. And now he's asking for you and I to die to ourselves so that he can live in us and through us so that he can receive glory. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yvette, why don't you just go ahead and come up to the front, if you don't mind. I was going to read you a whole bunch out of 1 Peter, talking about desiring the spiritual milk of the word. But I will tell you that at the end of 2 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, I mean, verse 11, <coughs> it says this. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. You know what, you know what Peter's saying? Peter's saying this world is not your home. Boy, it's taken me a long time to realize that. I got saved when I was 19. It doesn't have to take that long. It helps when you hear the word of God and you read the word of God. But he says, Beloved, I urge you as a sojourner and an exile that you would abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. He's saying that there's certain passions in your flesh that if you yield to them, if you yield to the lusts of the flesh, they're going to, it's going to create a war against your soul. Again, what is your soul? Your mind, what you think, your will, what you want, and your emotions, what you feel. I can tell you right now that the reason that so many people are on medicine today is because they're not abstaining from the lust of the flesh and that it's creating a war on the inside of their soul. I'm not saying that that's always the case in every situation, but I'm here to tell you that more times than not, I'm convinced that, that if we would yield to the will of God and allow Jesus to touch our mind and renew our mind with his hope and his truth, that he'd begin to heal us going to quiet the storm. But many times, instead of going to his word, we go to what we want. Many times, instead of going to what, he, to what the truth of his word says, we still live our lives according to our own will, our own wants. And it affects our mindsets. Our mind is not being renewed. We're still holding on to the old ways of Egypt. We're still longing for the watermelon and the leeks and the garlic or whatever supposedly Egypt had, which was nothing but a bunch of slavery. And we're not being renewed in our mind. You get the point that I'm making. Let's stand up tonight. Amen.